The Iowa caucuses are just 19 days away, and it appears that Nikki Haley, while still trailing Donald Trump in the polls, finds herself the best-positioned Republican candidate who has the potential to close the gap with the former president. And after securing the endorsement of popular Republican New Hampshire Governor Governor Sununu earlier this month, the former South Carolina governor is stumping tonight in the Granite State, where she continued her apparent strategy of handling Trump with kid gloves. I believe President Trump was the right president at the right time. I support a lot of his policies. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. These are just about the toughest words you're going to hear Haley lob at Trump in a stump speech. And according to one New York Times reporter who's been following Haley on the campaign trail, Ms. Haley's apparent reluctance to attack her rival, even in the face of what would seem to be political setbacks for him, has raised questions from voters and other Republican competitors about whether she can win while passing up crucial opportunities to derail her most significant opponent. Joining us now, former Republican Pennsylvania Congressman Charlie Dent. He served six terms in the House from 2005 to 2018. Congressman Dent, thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Jonathan. All right. Uh, of the two people on the screen, you're the one person who's actually run for office. Can you please explain Nikki Haley's strategy? How is she going to close the gap with the front runner if she's not going to attack the front runner? There are legitimate re ways to attack him. Yeah, as a guy who won office, I ran for office 13 times in competitive districts. And one thing I learned is that in, you know, if, if you're going to try to beat somebody, an incumbent in this case, which we're treating Donald Trump like, you need to attack that person frontally and directly. I don't think there's any way to sugarcoat this. It's very hard uh, to run a campaign and use these, these rather gentle jabs against Trump. She has to make a case that Donald Trump must be fired before she can be hired. And she is, I think she's run a very effective campaign in many ways, very disciplined, very mm -hmm. smart, uh, strategic. Uh, but right now, it just still feels like she's running for second place. She's been very aggressive with Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, and she's been pretty direct with uh, with uh, Ron DeSantis. But those guys don't have a chance of becoming the nominee. She does, and, and Trump is the lead dog, and she just has mm -hmm. not been as aggressive as I think she needs to be. And Chris Christie kind of called her out on that. You know, he, she needs to channel her inner Chris Christie and, and sharpen those stilettos, as she said. She uses them as weapons. <laughs> she's right. going to have to sharpen those. She's got, she's got to do that. I mean, I, it doesn't make sense to me. If you're running for office, you have to take down the top. You have to take down the leader. But, but Charlie, is the reason why she's not sharpening, the, sharpening those stilettos is because she's afraid of alienating Trump voters? Yes. I mean, she's, she's running this campaign where she's, she feels as if the non-Trump and the anti-Trump Republicans uh, are, you know, feel she hasn't been tough enough on Trump, and then the pro-Trump Republicans feel like she's too tough on Trump. So she's trying to she's trying to thread this needle. I don't think you can really do that. I, I think she has to get in the lane and just take it, be aggressive, and really call Trump out for his conduct and his behavior. Uh, and and I think they not just Nikki Haley, but the other candidates other than Chris Christie have missed opportunities to slam Trump on these various indictments where they should be calling him out on his, his reckless behavior and bad judgment, and rather than more or less jumping to his defense, which has really em empowered Donald Trump mm -hmm. and protected him. Uh, and, and, and frankly, that's why so many Republicans are still with him, because his opponents, you know, have not really called him out on these egregious uh, areas where Trump mm -hmm. has uh, been, been, been horrible. And so I think well, that's her problem. And I, I, you know, she might look, but luckily for her, you have the Iowa the Iowa caucuses where Trump's likely prevail, but New Hampshire often goes the other way. So that might save her in the end. I hope it does. I mean, it will, that, that could help her because, you know, when, when, Iowa's, when Iowa zigs, New Hampshire often zags, and uh, mm -hmm. that could work to her benefit. Let me squeeze in two, two more questions for you before we're out of time concerning the other candidates. Should all those other folks drop out, DeSantis, Christie, Ramaswamy, whoever else is running and we've already forgot about? Well, Ramaswamy, yes. Uh, he's going nowhere. He's, I, I don't understand his candidacy other than to get another job when he gets done with this race. Uh, DeSantis, he, his campaign has been in a free fall for some time. 
don't see a path for him. Probably be smart for him to get out. But that doesn't necessarily mean the Sanders voters will necessarily fall to Haley. Uh, that's that's not how the math works. So I think that's the case. And Christie's staying in, too, because I think he sees an opportunity in the event Trump really does falter. And, you know, he wants to be the guy to pick up the pieces and he'll run that aggressive campaign. OK, and then and, and then on on uh, G Governor Christie. I mean, he has been aggressive. He has been, you know, that the the attack dog. He has not shied away from the fight, and yet he's gone nowhere. So, is the lesson from Chris Christie is the lesson in Chris Christie's candidacy that that kind of tactic just isn't going to work in the Republican primary, and so it won't work for Nikki Haley? Well, it's it's not working for Chris Christie as it as it should. Uh, but what what is clear though is that a lot of the Christie voters, if they were to uh, go to another candidate. At this point, it appears a, a significant number of them, or most of them, would go to, to Nikki Haley. Uh, but for whatever reasons, you know, Chris mm -hmm. Christie has not been able to resonate uh, with uh, enough Republican voters. His attacks have been perceived as a little bit too harsh, uh, too negative. But at the same time, you know, Nikki Haley's strategy isn't necessarily working either. <laughs> She's still well behind Donald Trump, at least nationally, in closing the gap in New Hampshire. So uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say which strategy is better, but we're going to find out soon enough. Uh, whether Nikki Haley's strategy works if she continues down this path. She still does have a real shot in New Hampshire, though. That's right. We are going to find out soon enough. Former Republican Congressman Charlie, Jan Charlie Dent, thank you very much for coming on tonight. Thank you, John. Today, the Defense Department announced another $250 million package of military aid to Ukraine to counter Russia's war on that democratic nation. The United States will send Ukraine artillery, ammunition, air defense capabilities, and anti-tank weapons from existing DOD stockpiles that Congress previously appropriated. But with Republicans in Congress balking at, any, at providing any new assistance, the Biden administration may soon be forced to change its support for its embattled ally. Last week, the New York Times reported that Russian President Vladimir Putin has been quietly signaling that he is open to a ceasefire in Ukraine. Now, with Ukraine's counteroffensive stalled in the east, it appears the Biden administration may be privately thinking along the same lines. Politico reports today that, quote, the Biden administration is quietly shifting its focus from supporting Ukraine's goal of total victory over Russia to improving its position in, a, in an eventual negotiation to end the war. Such a negotiation could result in Ukraine having to give up most, if not all, of the roughly 20 percent of its territory currently under Russian occupation. Joining us now, Michael Hirsch, contributing writer at Politico magazine and columnist at Foreign Policy magazine. Michael, thank you very much for being here this evening. So is, is this a change of strategy from the U.S., um, this talk, uh, this ch change in strategy that you wrote about in Politico? And if so, why now? Well, it's a shift. Uh, there's no question that the Biden administration has been hinting really almost since the beginning of the conflict that eventually it would have to end in some kind of negotiation. The president himself uh, wrote that in a New York Times uh, op-ed back in 2022. Uh, but now, because of uh, the holdup in aid, not just uh, from the U.S. Congress, but also the problems uh, in terms of getting an additional $50 billion or so dollars of aid from the Euro European Union, uh, they're starting to think uh, that they need to uh, shift to a defensive posture uh, that can take them through the coming months. Uh, and this is also a response to the failed uh, counteroffensive that the Ukrainians launched in June, uh, which has been largely stalemated in the East. Mm. Uh, so they're beginning to think uh, that they need to uh, adjust to these current circumstances by uh, uh, b bolstering air, air defense systems, uh, redeploying forces along the Eastern Front now into more of a, a, a defensive posture, uh, and setting up defenses in the North uh, along the border with Belarus, uh, where they could prevent any further mm -hmm. aggression by the 
You know, so uh, when the New York Times reported um, its story on the front page on Sunday about what Putin was saying privately, I had the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, Oksana Makarova, on my show for her response. L listen to what she had to say when I asked her if um, a ceasefire would be something Ukraine would agree to. Whatever, uh, you know, uh, lies Mr. Putin would like to spread, uh, we should listen to his actual signals. And he keeps bombing Ukrainian cities on a daily basis. They might want an operational pause, which they have been, you know, trying to get in order to get more weapons from their friends, from Iran and North Korea and others. Uh, if they really want peace, there is a very simple solution to that. They should stop their aggressive war, get out from Ukraine, and the peace will return to Ukraine the next day. He wants to destroy all Ukraine and not only Ukraine. So let's not get fooled by whatever, um, you know, rumors he would like to spread. And so, Michael, very, very tough words, very definitive words. And of course, they would say she would say that and President Zelensky would say that publicly. Um, but would they negotiate? Right now, they're not giving any indication they'll negotiate. And I asked uh, a Biden administration official about that New York Times report, and uh, his response was there are no serious discussions that he is aware of. Uh, there may be hints. Uh, this may be, uh, you know, a kind of uh, back-channel offering uh, by Putin, but uh, there's nothing really uh, on the record. There's no indication there's going to be any negotiation anytime soon. Uh, most uh, experts believe that Putin will want to wait until he sees who wins the U.S. Uh, presidential election in November, because Donald Trump uh, obviously uh, has been much more sympathetic uh, to Putin's aims than the current president. So uh, no one expects that there's going to be any negotiation soon, nor is there any expectation that if there is a negotiation, uh, either side is going to give in uh, very much. I mean, the idea, uh, you know, obviously one sympathizes with what the ambassador said, but the idea that Russia is simply going to uh, give up and, and turn tail and, and retreat entirely uh, from eastern Ukraine is not realistic. Uh, so there, there's an expectation that there's going to have to be a negotiated ceasefire or a truce of some kind, and it may not come for a year or so. But the point is that both sides, and in particular the Ukrainians, uh, who you know, I'm writing about this week uh, in Politico, that they are posturing themselves to be in the strongest possible position uh, mm -hmm. when such a negotiation comes. Michael Hirsch, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Brittany Watts overcome with emotion after learning her case is moving forward. Watts is charged with felony abuse of a corpse, accused of trying to plunge a toilet after having a miscarriage delivery at 22 weeks while using the restroom. This 33-year-old girl with no criminal record is demonized for something that goes on every day. Those are just some of the details. A grand jury in Trumbull County, Ohio, is weighing as it decides whether to indict a 33-year-old medical receptionist with felony abuse of a corpse for her actions after having a miscarriage. In September, Brittany Watts became one of the tens of thousands of Americans who suffer the trauma of miscarriage every year. But a few facts made Watts' trauma distinct. Nearly 22 weeks pregnant, Watts had a rare natural second trimester miscarriage, and it happened 15 months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, allowing state after state to criminalize not only abortions, but pregnancy itself and the various outcomes that come with it. For those reasons, Watts' doctors spent eight hours debating the ethics of treating Watts even after they determined the pregnancy was not viable. Oh, and the nurse who reportedly rubbed Watts' shoulders and told her everything would be okay after her miscarriage? Well, she reported Watts to the police. Earlier this month, Watts told the Washington Post, quote, I am grieving the loss of my baby. I feel anger, frustration, and at times shameful. She's not alone. From Kate Cox to Amanda Zorowski, women in red states across the country are showing us how dire things can get when courts become the arbiters of whether you live, die, or face charges while pregnant. 
Joining me now, Mini Timuraju, president and CEO of Reproductive Freedom for All, formerly known as NARAL Pro-Choice America. Mini, thank you for being here tonight. Um, this case, this, this Watts case is, is beyond enraging. It's infuriating. And it's ju just like her attorneys were arguing in court. This is a woman who is going through something that hundreds of thousands of women have gone through, right? Problems in pregnancy, miscarriages. She should be treated with compassion, with dignity, with care. But because of this climate and environment we're in now post Dobbs, this is the America that has been wrought, right? This is a climate where doctors and administrators were clearly afraid to make a decision, and she's now being punished for it. I was about to ask, so why are, I mean, this, I'm no doctor, I'm no lawyer, but this is astounding on its face. So why are prosecutors who are supposed to have judgment and discernment, why are they bringing these cases? Why, why is Ms. Watts on trial here? You know, this is a case where uh, our colleagues at the organization, If, When, How, are working really closely with her attorneys, with Brittany Watts' attorneys, and they've made the case that this prosecutor has the discretion to drop this case. So it is a really big, important question. We are asking through our various colleagues and networks to weigh in with the prosecutor's office to drop the case, put pressure on the governor's office. But look, there has been a history of criminalizing pregnancy in this country. You know, since 20, 2006, there have been over a thousand cases like Brittany Watts. They don't get in the headlines, but they're, tra they're tragedies across the country. Just after um, SB8 happened in Texas, there was a publicized case um, in the Rio Grande border uh, of a young woman who was being prosecuted for a pregnancy outcome. We know that in anti-abortion states and in abortion ban states, even pre-Roe, that these climates create uh, an interest in prosecuting pregnancies and prosecuting doctors. And so this is something we've been monitoring for a long time. It's definitely a priority of the anti abortion extremist right movement tied into the personhood movement as well. I just have to, I, I, the, the, the fact that the nurse who was comforting Ms. Watts is the one who reported her to the police. Why report her to the police? I mean, does the law say you must, re you must report this person to the police? No, there's nothing in the law that indicates that she should be in court at all or being prosecuted, period. There's nothing that is clear about this case. What we do know is she's a young woman, and I'll say it, she's black. Okay, good. Because I'm like, th 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 I mean, come on. Yes. So she is definitely in a different category, right? Pregnancy while black, we know you've covered it. You know, it's been covered widely lately, um, thanks to some really big public cases mm -hmm. like Serena Williams. Pregnancy while black is incredibly dangerous. Now we're going to add the trauma of possible prosecution and persecution of these women in the most difficult time in their lives. So we know that for cases like this, when you have a young woman who's black, she's definitely more susceptible to bias and to criminalization. We see it in so many Many areas of black life and for people of color and for immigrant women, it's not shocking to me that that is happening in this case as well. And so then is the recourse here, um, the, well, the recourse here is the courts trying to get this, get these laws knocked down, but is, is the recourse politically um, for, for candidates who are pro-reproductive rights to hammer the hell out of this yes. issue. I'm really glad you brought it back to the candidates because we know that the American people are adamantly opposed to prosecution of providers and doctors, to prosecution of patients, to criminalization of outcomes. Focus group and poll after poll show this. So candidates should be unequivocal and clear. It's not just about fighting abortion bans. It's also about fighting abortion stigma. It's also about pregnancy justice and pregnancy safe and healthy pregnancies for all Americans. But we know in cases like this post-Dobbs, women of color are the most impacted, and we have to address that and be upfront about it. The good news is we know Vice President Kamala Harris has been doing a great job of talking about this, and I expect to see her do more of that in 2024 as she embarks on this reproductive freedom tour. I was about to say she is going to be doing more starting next month. She's yes. going, she is going on that tour. Many, many Timiraju, thank you very much thank you. for coming to the show this evening.